All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Philip said, this is going to be a talk that's going to talk about a few different aspects of climate change. One is uh, how the climate's changing. Secondly, how it's impacting Florida specifically and what adaptation measures are currently out there for working lands. I'm going to focus this talk just on agriculture primarily uh, with some discussion on forestry at the end of this, uh, but because of the length, we can't go into detail on all of that. Because I also wanted to spend just a little bit of time at the end talking about the uh, fifth uh, national assessment that was released yesterday. So without any further ado, we'll get started. I am the director of the Southeast Climate Hub. Uh, we have jurisdiction within the USDA of the uh, Southeast United States with the range map being uh, shown on the bottom here. And our objective is to increase the resilience of working lands to climate change and, and variability through adaptive management practices. So we were established originally in 2014 by the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack, who's also now the Secretary of Agriculture in his second term, but he and uh, President Obama were Concern that climate change and variability may impact uh, the sustainability of food and fiber for the United States. And so we were tasked with the mission of making climate smart decision making tools for land managers to use. So uh, we developed a whole bunch of different tools, and I'll go through some of those today. But all of them are designed to make the working lands, the farms, forests, and rangelands of the U.S more resilient to whatever kinds of change may come down in the future. Of course, this isn't the first time we've had these kinds of challenges in the United States. These are pictures of the Dust Bowls from the 1930s. The Dust Bowls were sort of a wake up call for us with regard to uh, what can happen when we mismanage the land. Uh, for those who aren't aware uh, of that period, it was a period of a relatively dry conditions. And at that point, there were no kinds of conservation practices being used. And so when the soils dried out and the winds blew up, we had um, major impacts on soil erosion and, and loss of productivity. But now we have a new kind of challenge called climate change. Um, and I think Mark Twain hit it pretty well when he said, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And so this is a nice graph that kind of talks about the difference between climate and weather. And in the lower left corner of this graph where you have uh, lengths talking about days and um, variability is just is fairly low, that's weather. So when we do a three day, five day, seven day, now we can do 14 day forecast, we're talking about the weather. But as we start getting into forecasts, get into <clears throat> Excuse me, months hey, or years. Steve, real real quick, I just want to um sorry to interrupt, but we may not be seeing right. the same slides that you are seeing. Uh right now I'm looking at the photo with the like teenage boy in like the Dust Bowl era. Okay. Yeah, no, you're not. Let me I'm not quite sure what that would be. Let me see. Now is it changing? It has not changed for me yet. Right? I don't know why it stopped doing that. Um, hmm. oh, okay, so now we're right. seeing the Twain um, quote. And then we have okay. the, so the graph with the X and Y lines. Okay, so so you're, you're caught up. I'm not sure why. Are you still seeing that graph? Well, now it went back. <laughs> All right, it's one of those days. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's try this here. Stop sharing. Give a second. What do you see now? Sure. Uh, the you are sharing your screen right now, but it's uh, the PowerPoint. It's yeah. kind of a zoomed-in version of the um, edit form. 
Okay. Um, I also so do have now, the slides pulled up on my computer. Um, I know it's not ideal, but I'm happy to share them as well. I think we should do that unless this works right now. So are you seeing Mark Twain now? I'm seeing the picture of the boy. Okay, the so let's now I'm seeing Twain. Okay, well, all right. Well, let's let's see if it continues on. We have a problem again. Uh, sure. Let's go ahead and switch. All right, we take off where we were. Um, hopefully this graph is advanced now to a, a simple uh, X, Y axis diagram. We're there now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll hopefully stay. All right, so how weather becomes climate change. In the lower left, we have weather. Um, it's in days. As you move up the um, Y axis and move up to years, that becomes climate. And then as you shift from low historic variability to high on the X axis, the horizontal axis, then that becomes climate change. And so where we are now and what we're going to talk about for the rest of this, this period is talking about climate change and the impact it's having in the area. So I think most folks are pretty well aware of these kinds of graphs. We should be moving, this should be now a graph of CO2. Um, beginning around 1850 with the Industrial Revolution, we started to emit more CO2 into the atmosphere. And the result, the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has been increasing up to over 240 parts per million now from where it was about 150 years ago, 280 uh, parts per million. So as a result of these uh, gases, what they call greenhouse gases, they call it because the CO2 acts sort of like a blanket around the earth trapping more of the heat. We started to see these record temperatures beginning and really it hit home starting around um, the 1980s and, and from there forward. So these are just some examples of what we've seen over time. This is January uh, of 2016, the hottest temperature ever recorded for a month. Now these are global temperatures. So when it's winter in the Northern hemisphere, it's summer in the Southern hemisphere. So literally any month of the year could be the warmest temperature uh, on a global basis because it all evens out. So January, 2016, what we got in February of that same year then became the warmest temperature. Um, moving forward a few years to July of 2019 was the warmest temperature globally. And then uh, 2019 became one of the warmest years in the Southeast uh, there. And then we jump up to May of 2020 and May of 2020 then became the warmest year ever recorded. And this goes back to 1880. Uh, finally, we get to this year. And um, July 3rd through 5th were the hottest days ever recorded on Earth. Um, August then broke the record of this year as the hottest month on record. And then um, it was also the hottest month in Florida. If we look at the contiguous U.S. for 2023, the South has been um, quite warm. Other parts of the U.S. have been warm as well, but it's record uh, warmth for Florida this year, going back to 1895. So um, October was the fifth straight month to set a new heat record. So since uh, May, we've been setting a new uh, all-time heat record globally uh, every month. And because of this, um, we're likely to set our record for 2023 being the warmest year ever. Uh, you can see 2016 was the previous globally warm year, and you can see how much different 2023 is from May. It's just, it's shattering the old record. So if we look at this globally going back to 1881, uh, we see that, you know, the temperature has been increasing again. It's, there's variation in there until you get to about the 1980s, and now it's pretty much going up on a very consistent basis. We look at the 10 warmest years ever, going back again to 1881 globally, and they've all been um, within the last 10 years or so. So, you know, it's not surprising when, when you look at the end of this curve, those are all significantly above um, the previous years. And then uh, 2023 will be above all of those. So that is, a, that is a concern, but really what's concerning scientists more than the heating we've already seen is the heating that we could see. So you're looking now at a graph that uh, talks about mean global temperature change with emission scenarios. The darkish blue line represents the best case scenario. 
we're pretty much on, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to meet that scenario at this point. So the dark blue line probably is not going to happen, almost certainly. The lighter blue line is something that we're still shooting for. Um, as far as the global temperature increases, you can see that um, that's quite a bit higher than where we are right now. It's almost double the heat that we've seen since the 50s. So. That orange and particularly the red line, I'm looking at the green catastrophic. Our, our global heat temperature is now to the shooting at more that light bluish line. Um, as you can imagine, there's already been a lot of impacts with the warming that's occurred. If you really want to know what, what impacts are likely to occur, go to the insurance industry because they this is their job is to look at risk, risk analysis, and the cost of doing business. So they have some of the very best case studies and, and best studies in general for impacts. And so there are several studies they've done. Um, they've determined that extreme heat um, is going to hurt uh, farms and agriculture, and they have reports on what that would be. So farm insurance and those sorts of things come in and impact. Um, one of the ways it impacts it is corn yield. And corn yield is, is impacted because of the uh, nighttime temperatures. As the nighttime temperatures warm, and they're warming more than daytime temperatures, the plants respire. It's like any other living uh, entity, they breathe. Worm breathes in CO2 and expires oxygen, but it takes energy. So the warmer they are, uh, the more of this energy they use in respiration, and that reduces corn yield. Um, other major crops are also, it's just not a solely corn issue. Many other crops are, are also being affected by yield uh, with the increase in temperature. And it's not just the row crops that are being impacted, things like livestock, uh, cattle heat stress of all kinds are reducing the breeding efficiency, milk production, feed intake, weight gain, and even causing death under extreme conditions. Same is true for poultry. Uh, it's impacting poultry production. Uh, the birds aren't being able to put on as much weight as quickly. Uh, and they're having more stress and stress-related uh, mortality. And we talk about the heat as, as a major issue, and it certainly is, but we don't think about the lack of cold. And so these chill hours, is, as farmers know, um, are really important for many types of crops, um, including you know almonds, walnuts, prunes, pears, peaches. All of those require a certain amount of chill hours. If those chill hours are not met, then the crops suffer. And uh, that's occurring more and more in the Southeast as, as the years are passing and we're having these progressively warmer winters. Here's an example of what the, the future holds. Um, we're looking on the top or on the far left bottom corner is historic climate from 1971 to 2000. And so even that has some of the built-in climate change already in it. And you see the number of days that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And right now it's in the 15 to 30 range for most places. Some isolated areas in that 30 to 45 range. The projected is on the right, and this is not far away. 2041 is barely uh, 15 years away. And um, 2070 is not that much farther behind it. That shows what it's going to be like under the current projections. And these are actually fairly um, conservative and how that will change. If you look at Florida, that's the difference between the two. So right now, if Florida is repeating, uh, having between up to 15, 95 degree days and in some cases 30, 95 degree days, um, over this next time period, it might be closer to 30 or 50 or more days like that. Um, <clears throat> so this extreme heat isn't only impacting just uh, the crops, it's also impacting workers. Um, and climate change isn't the only impact. So right now, one in five rural hospitals are at risk of closing. Um, and that, according to uh, Navigate, the insurance industry that kind of watches that. More than 100 have closed since 2010. And um, that's according to the University of North Carolina. And between 1999 and 2010, the Centers of Disease Control of Extreme Heat 
caused over 7,000 deaths, making it a leading, leading cause of weather-related death um, in the region, much more than hurricanes and, and other types of um, considerations we normally we normally look at as, as uh, causing mortality. And of course, as we get warmer, these uh, deaths and, and uh, injuries will increase substantially. Hey, Steve, real quick, I think <laughs> we, we might have been one slide behind um, as you were going over the past few slides. I know a couple of people commented, but just wanted to make you aware. Okay, thank you. What slide are you seeing now? Right now we're seeing extreme heat on agriculture. Okay, all right. Now, and now did you see it in advance? Yes, we often only consider okay. the direct impacts. Perfect, okay, thank you. This probably won't be a recording that we'll be able to share very well, but um, for those who attend, um, often, and often we only do consider the uh, temperature increases on working land, and that's what I've talked about. But really, some of the major considerations don't include temperature. Uh, they include other factors. One of them is hurricanes. This is uh, from the, the latest uh, National Climate Assessment. It shows the number of billion dollar disasters by state from 1980 to 2022. Uh, you know, Florida isn't the number one. Uh, Georgia and North Carolina have more, but Florida certainly has um, its share of hurricanes and that is a major impact. And so what we're looking at when we look at these changes in, in risk and impacts on agriculture and forestry is how this new climate is shifting. And so this graphic shows that uh, the two kind of uh, bell-shaped curves we have here. The one on the left shows our current climate, where we have this distribution more or less evenly of hot and cold uh, chances for extreme um, temperature. As we shift to a new climate, we're going to have more of the extreme weather and more of the extreme hot and less of the extreme cold. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't have a record cold day any given day. It just means that the probability is going to be increasing the less. And the probability of an increasingly uh, extreme hot day will be more. So right now, this I pulled off um, earlier this week. This is the drought map for um, Florida and, and southeastern U.S., or part of it at least. And, you know, this is typical. We see drought periods always. We always have and we always will. But as the temperature increases, um, we'll likely see more of these kinds of droughts. And there's something called the Bermuda High, which traditionally sits over Bermuda, uh, particularly in the summer months. But with climate change and shifting of jet streams, that Bermuda High has been shifting farther west. So we're more likely to have what they call these heat domes sitting on top of us in the southeast, where it's going to be hot, dry, stagnant air uh, for longer periods of time. And that's likely to, be, to um, get progressively worse. So let me shift a little bit here now and talk about some opportunities for addressing some of these challenges. No-till is one of the practices that's almost universally done in the Midwest these days. I talked about the dust bowl earlier and uh, some of the issues they have, but they use that extensively in that region. And Southeast is still catching on. There's, there's a lot of folks that, um, most folks still aren't using no-till in agriculture, but it has a lot of advantages to it. Um, it keeps the soil pores open, the soils can, uh, aggregate and are not destroyed, so it keeps them more permeable to water, so when you get the uh, precipitation, it absorbs more quickly. It also helps to get rid of the weeds. Uh, seeds are not replanted when we uh, when we till open the soil for the replanting. You know, we get uh, pigweed and some that are resistant to uh, glycophosphates, and we just can't get rid of them. So uh, doing no-till or limited till really helps with also increases the organic matter content and other things which help to store that water when we have it. So when we have the drought, we're likely to um, have less problems on those kinds of fields as far as uh, loss of productivity. Another important uh, tool we have at our disposal are cover crops. And again, these are now becoming used more, more frequently in the south, but not as much as they could. Um, and you know, similar to um, no-till, they help to retain the soil's moisture um, they also help to put organic matter into the soil. And uh, depending on the crop, you can also get a, a secondary crop out of it over the um, primary non-growing season. Um, again, you know, a lot of the same types of advantages for this. If it's a legume, it supplies nitrogen, which reduces fertilization costs. 
improve the soil health and water infiltration, increasing the organic matter, weed control, and nutrient recycling. Lots of benefits to what we're talking about. Crop rotation is something that pretty much everyone practices, so I won't dwell on it, but um, you know, it breaks pest cycles when you do crop rotations. Uh, it also increases the organic matter, it improves nutrient utilization, um, and it provides a window for other types of management, such as spreading manure and uh, those types of activities. So there's a lot of uh, activity that should be done in, in crop rotation and not just replanting the same field with the same crop year after year. Now let me talk a little bit about extreme precipitation. We talked about um, extreme heat. When you have heat in the atmosphere, heat is energy. So the more heat you have, the more energy you put into the atmosphere and the more precipitation, the warmer it can become, the more rain it can hold. So it seems strange to talk about increased drought, but also increased rain, but that's what we're having. When it rains, it rains harder, but then it may be a longer period of time before we have that rain event again. So this is a graph that goes from 1910 to about 20, uh, 2020, and it shows uh, extreme precipitation one day events, and they're increasing. So again, it's showing this impact of, of the energy in the atmosphere. Uh, contour plowing is one of the practices we can use in agriculture in Florida. Not a lot of contour, not a big uh, issue here, but uh, in many other areas, doing contour plowing really helps to uh, reduce soil erosion from stream rain events where you would have a lot of overland flood. It helps with water quality and also, of course, keeps the soil on the landscape. You probably all heard about El Nino and La Nina now, the uh, oscillations that occur. You know, they've always occurred, they'll always occur. The bottom graph there shows uh, shifting between La Nina and El Ninos uh, over time and um, the impacts that have. We call, um, La Nina uh, normally comes around Christmas, and right now we're entering into an, uh, a La Nina uh, and an El Nino period. If you look on the left, the El Nino uh, period. We're uh, Steve. Sorry, we're once we're a slide behind again. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing a graph of the globe now? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, there's one. Okay. So here's a graphic that now should show El Nino and La Nina on the screen. On the left is, and this is for temperature. When we have a El Nino, we have a generally cooler temperatures in the Southeast. And we have a La Nina, we normally have a warmer temperatures over much of the Southeast. Likewise with precipitation, we normally have um, more precipitation uh, when we have an El Nino and we have less precipitation when we have a La Nina. As I mentioned earlier, we're now entering into an El Nino phase, a fairly strong El Nino phase. And so for Florida specifically, if you look at the top portion of this slide for different parts of Florida, it shows you from uh, October, December period, January, March, April to June, and July through September, the impacts it has. And again, generally it's a cool and wet period, or at least it's cool, or at least it's a wet period. I'm going to say cool everywhere, but it's generally wet uh, most every day. But that's what to expect in your in your area in the coming uh, months. So uh, here's just a slide showing that we have a strong El Nino winter coming. Could, so, could Florida see a white Christmas this year? You know, these are periods when we have um, cool, wet temperatures. So after talking all about month after month after record heat, um, you might see snow in Florida this year which is one of the confusing parts of climate change is that people, you know, they, they see this and say, well, it's not real, but it's all part of what's happening with this extreme variability. If you're not familiar with agroclimate, uh, you should be. This is a great tool to uh, look at. They have a lot of information about um, current conditions and um, different forecasts, seasonal forecasts. I'm gonna show a couple of uh, slides from that. Here's one that shows for the Tallahassee region of Florida during neutral years, El Nino years, and La Nina years. And this shows total rainfall in January in inches, uh, the probability of that happening. And you can see again- Steve, if you El could Nino just advance year, one, one slide. There we go. Okay. Can, you, can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. I, I, tell me when we get off because I don't know. I'm, I'm advancing, but I don't know why it doesn't on the screen. 
Um, in January, it shows that we are having um, likelihood of more precipitation through that period. So you can put in your location and your month, and you can see how that precipitation is, is uh, projected to change. This is really important because um, Clyde Fraze and uh, others who worked on agroclimate have done a really good job of looking at county level data to see how it varies under different conditions. And this should be a map that shows a lean new year's corn uh, yield. And so you can look at how uh, with different types of crops, corn just being an example here, in different locations, uh, if you have an increased or decreased yield for that particular crop under those uh, conditions of El Nino or La Nina. Under this condition, um, it looks like uh, under El Nino years, there's, and this is for Wake County, I did this in my, my home county, but you can do it for any, in that particular county, it's a fairly low, uh, less than normal productivity for corn because it is cool and wet and corn generally like warm and dry. So uh, a really good tool to have. Uh, this just shows what it's like uh, for all the different crops, in this case for corn and, and what it looks like under the neutral years and the two um, and so events. So the next thing I want to briefly talk about are hurricanes. And this kind of shows a graph of, of hurricane activity going back to 1851. A lot of noise in this, although in the last, again, since about 2000, um, you know, mid 90s, it does seem that there's more of the uh, storms starting to pop up. And again, a lot of this is because there's more energy in the atmosphere. Hurricanes need energy to grow when the water temperature is really warm. they are more likely to have a hurricane. And if that water temperature stays warmer longer, the season of hurricanes will be expanded. Um, of course, there's other factors that come into hurricane formation as well, and uh, they can cover after. But well, we all know about storm surge and the impact that can have. Uh, depending on the size of the hurricane, the storm surge can be quite extreme. Uh, so storm surge, of course, is uh, a mean sea level, a normal tide, and then the storm surge is on top of that tide. And depending where we are on tide that can increase or decrease the, the storm surge from a hurricane. Florida is pretty close to the water level. You know, there's a few areas that are a few hundred feet above uh, sea level, but most of them are in the in the dozens of feet above sea level or less. So particularly vulnerable to hurricane flooding. This just shows projections of the change in projected sea level rise with different types of um, climate change scenarios. At the year 2050, again, about 25 years away, and uh, 2080, not that far away either. So these are feet of intermediate, low, and high um, changes. These aren't absolute. These are in addition to what we would have now. So anywhere from uh, a foot to up to three feet uh, before the end of the century. And a lot of areas that you're looking at three feet is, is uh, underwater. Now we should be looking at a slide that talks about uh, USDA Climate Hub's Hurricane Preparation Recovery Guides for Florida. Um, these recovery guides were developed for uh, the entire Southeast, and they're designed to look at how you prepare for hurricanes and then how you recover from hurricanes after. So there were 23 guides in all, uh, including ones for forestry, uh, livestock production, row crop production, uh, orchard production. If you haven't um, seen these, I would encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, they're available on the website below, and if you just Google uh, Climate Hub Hurricane Guide, you'll, you'll come across them. We have some hard copies, but they're also available in PDF. Part of uh, hurricanes uh, are also, of course, soil salinization when you have flooding. Uh, we get soil salinization from other sources as well whether it's sea level rise or uh, irrigation of saline water. So we put together a uh, manual on how to identify, mitigate, and adapt to salinization of working lands in the Southeast. Again, if you want to uh, Google Climate Hub salinization guide, you'll, you'll find that. But um, there are many types of salinization from uh, drought, primarily out west, um, about water management, Kind of activity where we have channeling and allows salt water to enter into inland areas, sea level rise, and storm surge. 
Um, these guides are designed to look at the different stages of salinization. There should be a graphic showing uh, with the title of stages of salinization. We're behind top. one. One. We're behind one slide. Okay. okay. So this actually is stages of salinization. We're not there now. yet. Okay. I think it's the next one. Okay, where are we now? We're still on, um, okay, we're here now. I think there's just a bit of a delay there, but we're on that the stages. Okay, okay, you may not be ahead of me. Okay, so these are the stages. Um, this should be a graphic now that shows the different um, types of crops and how they're impacted by different levels of soil salinity. Root crop should be on the left, vegetable crop should be below it. And then it shows the changes in percent yield. So as your soils become more saline, <clears throat> you can shift from one crop to the next um, and still produce a crop. So certain crops are, are much more uh, susceptible to salinization than others. So I'm going to conclude here in the last couple of minutes um, with a uh, couple of slides from the fifth national assessment. I've been part of the fifth, of this national assessment since the very first one in 2000. I was the um, leading author for the forest sector on that one. And on this one, I was a coordinating lead author for the Southeast chapter. And it's been interesting to see how these assessments have changed over time. The original assessments were basically showing that climate change is a reality um, and that it's something we need to be concerned with. The next couple of assessments looked at the impacts. And now most recently, um, the last one before this was looking at how do we adapt to it? Kind of adaptation and mitigation. This one focused more on the human dimension and particularly on uh, groups that we haven't looked at before, the underserved and the represented communities. So we we barely talk at all about why we think climate change is real. That's just a done deal at this point. It's, it's silly to waste space on that, but we've moved on to trying to address the issues of the time. So in this fifth national assessment, there were um, different regions. There's the Southeast region, there were also sectors, as I mentioned, there were things like transportation, energy, uh, forestry, agriculture, many different components to the assessment. I'm just going to show a couple of slides uh, for the southeast. This one is a change in population, a change in population from 2010 to 2020 on the left side. And so we're behind again. I think okay. it's the next one. Yes. Okay, so this is the graph of the United States. Or so, yeah, this is the full United States graph. Okay. With the different regions shown. Okay, now it should advance to the population change in the Southeast. Okay, we're there now. Okay. So, uh, this shows on the left the population in 2020 compared to 2010. And then the one on the right is the population in 2050 compared to 2020. And so this doesn't have really anything to do with climate change, but it has a lot to do with how uh, climate change could impact us. It's no surprise, if you live in Florida, Florida is growing and it's going to grow even more. The population uh, is just going to increase. So that means that any of the impacts that occur are going to impact more people. So um, compared to other of the national climate assessment regions, the Southeast faces the largest economic risks. It always has and probably always will. This is the amount of damage done as a percent of county income. And you can see on this graph, uh, if you're seeing it, is that uh, Florida has by far the most impact on total damage. It's up above 15% of the total income will likely be impacted by climate change in some way. And this is, um, you know, continuous values for every year uh, moving forward. Part of the challenge we have is that um, where people are going to live, and the poorest people are often disadvantaged. This graph should show housing unit, how rental housing units at risk on the left, and again, Florida has a huge number. And on the right, it's the uh, percent changes in flood-related annual losses uh, between twenty. 20 and 2050. So if, if our rental units are at risk, and we lose those rental units, then where will the workers, which are a major part of Florida's agriculture, live? 
Um, we've seen the same problem uh, to a very small scale on, a, on an island called Okapook, North Carolina. It's a, on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, it had a major service industry through tourism. Um, they had a hurricane, Dorian came through a few years ago. It wiped out all the houses that were sitting on the ground, but the ones that were elevated were fine. Unfortunately, the ones that were on the ground were the um, older houses and often rented by uh, the service worker industry. And so once those were gone, then the restaurants and the folks that own those kinds of buildings couldn't find workers. So it's created this mass shortage of, of uh, uh, people to work in these areas and it's impacted the industry. That will happen on a much larger scale in Florida than in Florida. Um, also, because of the increased temperatures, we're going to see changes in the uh, air quality. So present day uh, air quality, PPM 2.5 levels, it shows the, the quality there is actually for Florida pretty good. Um, but other areas in the southeast, Florida to a certain extent, but more like Georgia, Alabama, where we have what I was calling again that Bermuda high, where it just sits there and it just creates large stagnant air mass, um, is going to have major impacts on air quality and, and premature deaths of 65 and older individuals going forward. There's going to also be impacts on the energy industry, but this is one where if we're proactive, if we work on our adaptation measures now for this, we can reduce uh, a large portion of those uh, damages. This is again, only in the next 25 years or so under a moderate scenario. Um, you can see that Florida is gonna have almost $2 billion worth of uh, damage to the infrastructure. Um, and if we uh, were proactive, we can reduce that down to a, still a large amount, a billion dollars, but much less than what it would be. So this is basically a call for action. Um, transportation is part of that infrastructure, and it shows, again, for road and rail, um, if we're proactive or not proactive, how that could be impacted uh, in the coming 25 years or so, and the average costs on that. So I'm going to wrap up now in summary. I say climate change is occurring now. You know, we used to talk about climate change is something we need to worry about. We're right in the middle of it. Um, we're at the beginning stages of it, but we are in it. Um, every day we're seeing these variations, we're seeing extremes, and so it's not a future thing, it's a now thing. Um, unfortunately, as a society, we waited too long to prevent the negative impacts on Florida and also globally, on uh, agriculture, human health, and the economy. And so we're going to see these um, become progressively worse over the next several decades. Uh, it's unavoidable. We, we, you know, we had the 20 years or so, we really didn't do what we needed to do, and now we're, we're paying the price. However, um, beyond the next 20, 30 years or so, we still can change the degree of severity through adaptation and mitigation measures. So we waited too long to prevent anything from happening, but it's still not too late to prevent the very worst from that. Some of those lines that you know go into the catastrophic line, those are still can be can be tamed a little bit, and we can do that through mitigation and adaptation. And producers who are willing to adapt to these changes have the best chance of remaining profitable and productive. Um, those who don't will simply fail, the same way as the Dust Bowl. If we didn't, if we didn't address it, we would fail. We address the Dust Bowl, uh, we address those conservation measures, and you know, those are not productive lands again. This is the same now, but on a much larger scale, on a global scale, and choices are. So uh, the good news is that we do have these resources. There's things like the Climate Hub and many other groups that um, have resources available for farmers, ranchers, and foresters to help to maintain their lands regardless of how the climate changes. I'm gonna finish with a, a shameless plug here for my uh, book that just came out. It's called Future Forests. It was published by Elsevier um, uh, just last week. And it talks about climate mitigation and adaptation to climate change. If you're interested, it is available on Google. Um, and with that, Philip, I will uh, mercifully end my slide uh, presentation here and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McNulty. And um, yeah, no, that was a great presentation. And um, thank you for working through all of the uh, technical challenges that's out of our control. And so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, as uh, Steve mentioned, 
Uh, we have some time for questions and comments. You can use the chat box. You can use the Q&A. Uh, feel free to put those in at this time. Uh, we did have one comment uh, from Chris Demers um, in the webinar. I've used the Forest Landowner Guide to provide a couple webinar series for our extension audience. So thanks for adding that, Chris. That's great, Chris. Maybe I maybe to comment on that briefly. Um, the idea with those guides that we produced were not just to produce the guides themselves, but Chris, you know, the fact that you use them on uh, put together a couple of webinar series is great. They're really designed to be worked. So um, when we put them together, the idea was always to go back to our um, our constituents, uh, particularly extension folks, and to uh, work with them to do some post some workshops. And uh, previously, the climate hubs were uh, didn't have the capacity to do a lot of these, but we've since um, gained five different interns, and their uh, job is specifically to to work with the different states on putting together workshops for um, extension and, and uh, other private owners who are interested in, in attending those. So um, each of my folks has um, three states and they uh, focus on working with the individuals in those states. So if any of you are interested in us um, working with you to put on a, a workshop, we can do a lot of the heavy lifting on that. Uh, basically what we're looking for are uh, you know, you to invite the folks you think would be useful. We have, I think, um, the name of 4,000 extension people across the Southeast for emails and, and all of that. So it's an extremely large database. And so we're already starting to schedule some of these workshops across the region. But, you know, things such as um, salinization, the hurricane guides uh, are ones that we already have on tap. We also are developing a series of guides for drought commodities so we're working on getting those uh, published as well so the idea would be that we would use these guides at a workshop then to um, use it as a baseline to discuss what what a landowner can do preemptively uh, from if they're just starting an operation up to annual changes that they can do or annual checks they need to do to make sure they're prepared uh, during the season when for example a hurricane is imminent what they do a uh, uh, week out because that's when we start to have some idea of where they may be going just a few days out um, for what to do just before and then of course after the hurricane how do you get your systems back up online how do you become productive again? so um, again we have those for the hurricane salinization guides and we're working on drug guides thank you for that very good information. Yeah. Uh, once again, if you have any uh, questions or comments, you can put those in the chat. Um, I will, I'll just ask a question that I was thinking about, um, you know, as someone who's in the education space, uh, what are some recommendations you have, Steve, for taking information from something like the fifth uh, national assessment and helping to translate that to producers or uh people in natural resources, or also just the general public as well, because a lot of this audience, you know, works with um, extension audiences and people um, and beyond as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, the National Climate Assessment, you know, is, is number one uh, mandated. So when in 1991, when the U.S. Congress proposed the U.S. to change research program, part of that funding required that a, a report was made to Congress every five years regarding what was learned. And so first and foremost, these climate assessments are, are a report to Congress um, to say what, what is the state of the nation currently with regard to climate change and also um, what is being done to address those changes. So as I mentioned before, the, these have kind of changed over time in the fact that we're not focusing on is climate change real, we've gotten past that, um, to you know what are the impacts, we've sort of gotten past that to a certain extent, although those are updated, um, but more of what can we do about it, what can we do to mitigate it and adapt to it, and who's this going to hurt most. Um, as such, these guides are meant to be more of a strategic document. It's not meant to be sort of a prescriptive or, or operational document. Um, the kinds of guides that we're putting forward with the hurricane guides and the 
televisation guides, those are meant to be more practical. If I own a um, uh, forestry plantation, what do I do? But these national assessments won't help a lot with that. They'll, they'll tell in very broad terms what's occurring and, and what could be done, but they're not prescriptive. Um, that's where you still need your extension people and you need um, your consultants um, to, to work with you on that to say, here's, here's specific types of activities that, are, that you can use. Now, I will say there's another uh, project that's in the works that folks who are in the forestry area may be aware of, and that is the Silvix of North America. Um, if you're a forester, you know what this guide is. It's, it's sort of the, the holy grail of, of how you manage the forests. And so um, within that, there are 200 chapters with each species being its own separate chapter. And those give you very prescriptive um, information on how you manage tree species. Uh, the problem is, is that that document hasn't been updated since 1990. Um, so it's very out of date. So starting um, this last spring, we uh, assembled a group of over 500 scientists to begin working on updating those documents. So um, over the course of the next year or so, we will be providing new chapters on each of the species uh, on there. There's over 80 currently in draft for now um, that will be published. And they'll have updated information on how you manage your forests, not only uh, through the traditional types of activities that occur, such as pine beetle and diseases, but also climate change, increased fire risk, uh, hurricane risk, drought risk, all those sorts of things will be part of the updated civics of North America. So there are documents that are out there that help us to um, better adapt and, and address these issues, but the national assessment is, is more of a general document for, um, for the general public. Great, thank you. Yeah, I don't there see other comments. And Find, um, you know, this, this presentation was designed mainly to be informational. And, uh, you know, what I like to say is just, you know, we're, the Climate Hubs have been around for a decade. Um, we're here as a resource paid by public tax dollars. And so if folks would um, like more specific information about their area, um, uh, their, their crop, their product, or would like information about how we could work with them to uh, give them either guides or, or lectures or workshops. We are very open to do that. Um, you know, if you Google Stephen McNulty, uh, you'll, you'll find me on the web. And uh, I would, you know, just open this up to folks that uh, if you want to contact me later for anything, um, I'm, we're very open to do that. We look forward to, to working with folks in, in that regard.